the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next.
my name is Erica Smith, and I'm a columnist with the Los Angeles Times. Welcome to our special screening of the critically acclaimed short film, The Beauty President. It's being presented by Breakwater Studios, Hillman Grad Productions, and LA Times Studios. In 1992, in the midst of the HIV AIDS crisis, LGBTQ activist Terrence Allen Smith launched a historic run for president of the United States. He ran in drag as Joan Jett Black with the goal of empowering the queer community in national politics. To kick us off, here's a word from our film, the film's uh, executive producer, Lena Waithe. Hello, my name is Lena Waithe, and I'm so honored to be an EP on The Beauty President. It's a short film that really documents one of our greatest pioneers, and I'm really honored that Whitney captured Terrence in this moment, and I hope that you enjoy watching this journey. It's a short film, but it's a mighty one, and this is someone that you should know. And if you didn't know about him before, I'm glad you get to learn. If you didn't know, I'm glad you're getting a refresher. But it's important that we tell stories like these so that we don't forget people like Terrence. Hope you enjoy The Beauty President. Because I've always loved politics, I got, I saw an opportunity to be a politician, <laughs> you know. And who am I? Well, I'm Joan Jett Black, Queer Nation's candidate for president in 1992. That's right, we're gonna put a drag queen in the White House. At some point, I realized that I actually made a little dent in history. a voice. They keep telling us everyone has a voice, but what do we hear? Absolutely nothing. That is not a voice. Everyone has a voice when I get elected. When I came out, you heard about gay people. <laughs> this whole broad community, you felt like you were a part of. It was like being at the forefront of this great new world. First thing that brought it into it was AIDS. Not many groups of people have had to deal with your friends dying in an early age like we did. I, I was watching you walk down the street and a lot of people were shaking their heads. But what do you say to those people? I say that they don't know beauty when they see it. They should be shaking their heads at George Bush being the president of America and not doing a damn thing about AIDS or health care. That's what they should be shaking their heads at, not me. The government responded very slowly at first. They ignored it completely because it wasn't happening to people that they care about. It wasn't happening to, you know, middle-of-the-road white people. It was happening to black people, it was happening to drug addicts, and it was happening to gay people. Doctors didn't want to touch you. You know, we all lived in, okay, what do I do if I get it? You know, who's going to take care of me? What's, what's going to happen? Our thing was visibility. I mean, we were still being beaten up. We were dying from AIDS. We were being denied jobs and housing, and you know, and the more visible we made ourselves, the less that happened. I'm sure you all are wondering what we queers are up to now. Well, we're going to the White House. The presidential campaign is one of the most worldwide visible things. Everybody talks about it. It becomes a huge issue in the media. So when the presidential race came up, all right, let's do that. I'm going to be the beauty president, and everything's going to be beautiful. We decided I was going to do that. We went in City Hall and filled out the papers. 
to be a right in Kennedy. Ronald Reagan was elected president. Now, if a bad actor can be elected president, why not a good drag queen? Then we got the opportunity to do the convention, the Democratic convention in New York, 92, that year. And boy, that was really something, because it was kind of scary. We were going to be gay press. We had press passes. Well, that day, we figured it out that they were not going to let me in, walk in the convention in full drag. You know, it's obvious that they don't want us to get anywhere near this convention. This convention, this whole situation is not for everybody. It's only for a select few. But that does not include us, because we could not get anywhere near. And if that doesn't include us, then it doesn't include 98% of the people who are watching this. What I decided to do was go in, not in drag, right? I had to go into the men's bathroom in the stall and did it in there. I was almost done. Some guard comes in. Somebody probably told him, there's a woman in there. So he came in, knocked on the door. He said, hey, this is the men's bathroom, right? I said, there's a man in here. <laughs> but then they came and they handed the pass over the top of the stall. And I, he was still standing there. And I opened the door and was like, I <laughs> So we get on the floor. Every camera that saw me went, <laughs> right? But when they asked me, are you, you know, supporting Bill Clinton? I said, no, I'm running against Bill Clinton. They were like, what? Oh my God, Jones at Black, the only drag queen presidential candidate in the United States. And I'm down here on this floor saying hi to all of America. Why, look, hi, America. <laughs> oh my God, this is so exciting. Look at all these people. Hi, y'all. So here we are, bringing queer issues to the campaign, right here, right now, in a dress. But I said, I really am running for president. And they were like, well, what would you do if you, you know, I said, well, health care. We should have health care. Period. I was going to take the military budget and the education budget and switch them. I was going to fire everyone in Washington and hire my friends, just like they did. We were going to do all of that. What are you going to do for the military in the U.S.? Well, I'm going to ban the military, so we won't have to worry about the military banning homosexuals. What would you do about this police state, Joan? What would you do? Well, first of all, I'd fire them all. All of them. I don't think we'll have much crime if people know who's really protecting them, you know what I mean? I tried to make as much sense as I possibly could out of where I was and the voice that I did have. And that's what people heard. A deep and profound change is needed in our attitude toward the world, our life on it, toward each other, and toward our conceptions of what is politics. Once you take away, get rid of all the, all the hate and all the anger, then things run smoothly. And that's what has never happened in this country. It was founded on, on who's better than whom. And once we're all equal, then it'll be smooth and no one will take advantage of anyone else. So it'll be very easy. Yay for Joan. Yay, Joan. <laughs> This being able to talk to people is not an accident. It's, it, it's, it's something that I can, I use for good. Somehow it, it actually worked that our being more visible made it a little bit, a little bit easier. I can't help but think about all of my friends that are long gone, long gone. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about some of them or one of them or two of them. I have this little thing that I do before I go on stage. Beauty before me, beauty behind me, beauty to the left of me, beauty to the right of me, beauty above me, beauty below me, beauty all around me. And I think of my friends. If, you know, we don't say their names, we, they'll go. 
then we go away. So we have an opportunity to keep their power alive by not shutting up. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that and learned a few things. I know I did the first first time I watched it and watched it, I think, three or four times now. Um, but I want to introduce our panel uh, who's going to be here to discuss that. First, we have Terrence Allen Smith, who we just saw as Joan Jet Black. And we also have Whitney Scoggy, who is the director of the film. So I wanted to welcome them both. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank Whitney. you. Hi, Terrence. <laughs> Terrence, I'm actually going to start with you. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, I'm going to start with you. So, you know, you touched on this at the, in the film, particularly at, at the end, um, about, you know, what you were experiencing in the 1990s. But I was wondering if you could expound upon that a little bit, particularly for some of the younger folks who might be watching who may have been like two or maybe not alive when, when this was happening. Can you talk a little bit about what your life was like and what it was like to be queer back then? Well, it was a little riskier than it is now, although it doesn't, looking back, it's hard to tell, but, you know, um, and at that time, this was 1990, friends of mine had been dying since 84, easily. So I'd lost many, many, many friends and a couple lovers to AIDS. And there was this feeling that you had to do something. You had to get involved. I was also um, a member of the Radical Fairies. So I was in involved in a few different ways. And there was this feeling that if we didn't do something, no one else was going to help us. Um, so we got out there and got in the streets and made things happen. Um, and that created this wonderful uh, camaraderie that we still have now, those of us that are still here. Uh, and that's, that's worth everything to me. Mm -hmm. you, it, we, in a previous conversation we had, you talked a little bit about the power of not shutting up, I think is how you put it. Um, you know, in that in that vein, can you talk a little bit about why you decided to to run for president in the first place, and you know how the mission of Queer Nation figured into that? Well, you know, it goes way way back. My mom always said I was a ham, and that you know I could just get in front of get in front of people and you know perform or something. And um, I had been doing drag off and on since seventy four, so. You know, I had this character or, or a couple of different ones that I could blend together. And I thought, well, you know, uh, we, I ran for mayor of Chicago before I ran for president. So I, I was already a seasoned politician. And um, I had a lot of fun doing that. So we just took that and put it in this run for president. I hope I answered that question. I'm not sure if I did. No, it does. Um, so you you ran. I didn't realize you ran for mayor of Chicago too. That's I love that. Um, yeah, that was. So Wendy, how did you first learn of Terrence's story, and and why did you feel compelled to to make this film? 
Well, I first found out about Terrence from an article that I found online. Uh, I work at Breakwater Studios and I was doing some research for another project. And I came across this article that essentially said 1992 drag queen runs for president. And I read it. And there was a photo of Terrence as Joan at the podium. And as a Black person, as a queer person, as a politically minded person, my brain kind of exploded and I couldn't believe that this was something that had happened that I didn't know about. Um, and ultimately the reason I decided to do this project was in this really intense desire and feeling of responsibility to preserve and celebrate Terrence's story. Um, as a queer person and again as a black person, there are so few heroes that we get to interact with. And the fact that Terrence is still here was felt so important. And as a documentary filmmaker, you just want to capture things so they don't get lost. And that was really the biggest driver for me was that I felt like this was a story that truly deserved everything in the world. And I just wanted to be a part of, um, a part of doing something about it. So how did you go about contacting Terrence? What was that like? Uh, I think I found an email and then I emailed him um, and we had like one phone call um, and we hit it off right away. And I think within maybe two weeks to a month, I was up in San Francisco filming. Um, so I think uh, Terrence and I both would agree that we have kind of this unspoken bonds um, that is kind of cosmic. And it just felt like we landed in each other's laps at the perfect time. Um, we shot this during the pandemic. Um, I mean, we're still in the pandemic, but we shot this in 2020 at the height of things. So it just felt like a lot of synchronicities were coming together. And um, yeah, so meeting Terrence the first time, just it was one phone call and then we, we went up and we shot. Mm -hmm. Terrence, what did you think of meeting Whitney? I mean, what was that like? I mean, you know, here's somebody who hadn't really heard your story, wanted to know more. Were you kind of, you know, surprised or were you like, oh, that's just one more person that wants to know about me? Well, it wasn't just like it was one more person that wants to know. But I'll tell you, I was very excited. I learned a long time ago to say no to nothing. If somebody asked you to film something, yes, sure, let's go because you never might, you might not get asked again. So that's gotten me into some, you know, wonderful places, absolutely. And uh, like, you, like what you said, we hit it off like that, which I'm not surprised at. I seem to attract women who are the only black, I worked with another filmmaker years ago that was the only black female lesbian from Glasgow. You know, so Montana is no, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. So, um, you know, we all stick together <laughs> somehow, you know. Yeah. And I felt that right away. It, it was really interesting in the film, just kind of, you know, going down, seeing the footage, obviously, the archival footage, but also just like hearing you talk about Terrence, about what it was like on the trail and how people were approaching it, particularly that, that scene about how you had to like change in the men's bathroom, which is... Yeah. yeah, somehow typical. But, you know, what was it really like on the trail? I mean, how did people, other than, you know, the footage we saw, how did voters and, and journalists and people kind of, rec you know, respond to you? Were they taking you seriously? Like, what was the general reaction? I was lucky because the media was, they needed something to, you know, kind of laugh at. So they had me and they really, nobody, I didn't get treated badly at all. They would ask questions you know, only a couple of shock jocks on the radio were like, oh, so, you're just black. Why do you want to, you know, what's the president in the dress? That kind of thing. But um, once I started talking, they were like, wait a minute. This kind of makes a little sense here. And I always said, they told us anybody could be president. So here we are. I'm going to prove that, you know, maybe somebody like us, more like us can. Because if you look at them, lined up, you go, nope, that, no, 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 you know. So mm -hmm. I was one that they, people would go, oh yeah, maybe, <laughs> you know. 
Yeah, it was interesting too because I mean, I you were arguably you know in drag and in definitely in spaces and in in front of people that some people were probably never seen somebody in drag before, but definitely in spaces that weren't used to seeing anybody in drag. And I think it was in a previous conversation you talked about drag as armor, which I thought was really fascinating. Can you talk a little bit about that concept of like bringing queerness into you know these spaces that historically haven't seen that? Drag queens have always been at, somehow at the forefront of a lot of different eras of gay life or somewhere in there. And we do, you know, it's just one thing to be in a bar doing a show and, you know, that kind of thing. But to take drag out of a bar and put it in on, on camera in the daytime in front of people was then you instantly, that's your armor. That's your drag is, is what protects you, but it's also, you know, it's, it's the first thing people see, but it is your armor. I mean, you know, it's, uh, why well, it makes you stronger. It just, it just does, you know, once you put it all on, you got nothing else to do, but go and, Whatever happens, happens. And I, I love that about it. I love that. Yeah. It's interesting, too, to, to see, you know, since 92, well, how many things have changed. But one of them has mm. been this kind of broad-based acceptance of, you know, of people in drag. I mean, the success of RuPaul's Drag Race, I think everybody sure. knows sure. that by now. But and this is a question of both of you. I mean, would it... And maybe you do, Terrence, maybe you can start, but talking about in some ways like the commercialization of drag, right? Like, what has that been like to watch over the last, gosh, 40 years? God, that's crazy, or 30 years. Yeah, you know, uh, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a long time, but like, <laughs> what has it been like to, to watch that, that arc of, you know, going from where you were, where people were just like, didn't know what to do to now there's like watch parties for, for RuPaul's Drag Race? Yeah, yeah, you know, at first, I would say, I would think, no, I don't know, because drag will never be completely mainstream. It just won't. It's just one of those things. But I can't tell you how wonderful, because when I first started doing drag, my heroes were Hibiscus and and, and Sylvester, and um, you know people like Charles Pierce who were doing shows, and oh, who else? Jim Bailey. I could go. The list is pretty long, but. Now, they're, well, they're, I always think of the drag queens that are in Kansas, you know, those, those are some brave, brave girls and, and, and drag kings and guys um, down there. The, you know, it's all across America. Now, now you have 10-year-old drag queens. You know, I worked at a different light bookstore in San Francisco, and I swear to you, some, a kid came in once and it was his parents who wanted to do drag for his school party, you know, and he's like 10 years old. So, I mean, it's it's reached that far that anyone who feels like they want to do it can do it. And that's what I mean by visibility. I still think that we won that war. We won the visibility war because after, you know, each generation made, made it easier and now it's Emmy-winning television. So... Um, we did our job, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we <did. Yep. laughs> Whitney, did you want to expound on that a little bit? I mean, you know, what's it been like in your lifetime just to see, you know, drag go from where it was to where it is? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You know, Terrence kind of brought up the fact that I'm from Montana and growing up in Montana during um, the George Bush era, was very interesting because I grew up during the time when people would say, you know, that's so gay as an insult. Um, people would say no homo as an insult. Um, the list goes on and on. But I think what I've seen in my time is like really this understanding that queerness is not something to frown upon. And I remember I had a teacher that called someone out for saying that's so gay and it changed my life. And I think Terrence is someone that continually calls things out, right? And Terrence's generation called things out so much to the point that my generation could come in 
and hopefully pick up the torch. And now what we're seeing happen is that you have a generation where, I mean, you have gender, you have sexuality, you have so many different things that are being deconstructed and understood in a way that has never been understood before. And I think the reason that is, is because of the groundwork that was laid from generation to generation to generation. And, you know, it, I, I, I kind of relate to Terrence in that it's a complicated feeling because for so long, this population was marginalized, not even marginalized, they were abused, they were killed, they were not taken care of. And so to have a society now where you can have a 10 year old drag queen, that's pretty incredible, but it's also gives you this like tension feeling where you're like, we're not fully out of the woods yet. Like you have to acknowledge everything that's still going on. This has been the highest year for death for trans and non-binary people. So we are not, yeah. we are not done yet, you know, but I think in terms of where we've gone, I have to give a lot of credit to Terrence's um, generation for the visibility play. You can't be it if you can't see it. And you also, uh, you can't, um, essentially what I want to say is you can't beat us all up, right? So the more that we're all out here doing things, the better. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Both. <laughs> coming out all the time, you know, you know that's, yeah, you're, I that's mean, you're always coming out. You're never, you're never not coming out. And I think like what we're seeing is like, we're seeing more and more people come out, but with that comes more and more conversations, comes more and more looking back. I think, um, you know, Lena at the top was talking about how important it is for us to acknowledge those who brought us to where we are today. And, you know, I just think like, it's just so incredibly important to understand that this didn't happen overnight. Like it wasn't like, RuPaul came out and the Drag Race show came on and everything was good to go. Like there was a lot, a lot that had to be done for us to even be having this conversation. Yeah, one of the things that was really interesting, you know, in the film and, it, and Terrence, it talks a lot about your campaign. I mean, if you look at, you know, a lot of what you were talking about, the stuff that we're talking about today, I mean, whether it's, you know, police brutality, criminal justice reform, military spending, healthcare, obviously, um, you know, how do you think, in some ways, I mean, you're, you know, what you were saying is something that a candidate, a Democratic candidate would say on the campaign trail today. How do you think? I was in the nation party. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was going to say, how do you think somebody, you know, or the public would respond to, you know, your candidacy today? Like, if you ran in, you know, in drag today, what do you think the response would be? <laughs> I'm afraid I get shot today, <laughs> but I mean, because we didn't have we didn't have the what are they the poor boys or the whoever they are we didn't have oh, them the running proud around boys you were proud proud boys, proud yeah, boys. we didn't have them running around back then and that's something to be concerned about you know we didn't yeah. have an insurrection back then um, people were still you could still use satire to get a point across back then and I don't know if you could if that really, if that fall, doesn't fall on deaf ears now. Um, that's one of the things that happened is that the media got it and they knew that what I was doing was satire and I was able to use it. I mean, they loved it in Chicago when I ran against Rich Daly because no one had ever done that and certainly not a black drag queen. They were like, this is a riot. And they treated me well. They didn't treat me like a stupid person, you know, and I was glad of that because I was worried about that. You know, mm -hmm. they, I thought, oh, boy, this is going to be ugly, you know. But like I say, once they started asking me questions and I gave them answers, they were like, oh, hmm. I mean, I talked about legalizing weed. It was, you know, here we are in California and it's legal now. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, hey, <laughs> some things do get done. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. When did you realize that, you know, how much impact on history your campaign had had? I mean, what, was there a moment where it was just like it, it kind of had dawned on you or was it has it been, you know, happened over time? It's still dawning on me. I'm still like, <laughs> because, you know, I I really didn't expect it, even though I was on TV and was in the press and had made, you know, a few inroads here and there. I certainly didn't expect I'd be talking about it 30, 40 years later. 
You know, I really had no idea that this would all happen. And it's it's very moving to be a part of, an, you know, part of history. History, somebody's story. <laughs> but it's really wonderful and moving to be a part of that because I never expected this to happen. I, you know, I didn't think it was going to fade away completely because I wasn't going to let it. But it's just tickles me to death <laughs> that I'm sitting here right now talking about it. You know, it's like, wow, I never would have imagined. When I was on in that bathroom stall, that was the last thing I was thinking about. You know, I was just thinking about getting out of there alive because that was the belly of the beast, let me tell you. You know, but it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it really was. And that, that made it all the... Mm -hmm. You know, we had the camp... Secret Service, we had Secret Service agents go into the room before I did. So, you know, Americans are easy, you can fool them. They believe, they saw, they'd be like, what's coming, what's coming, what's that, you know? Then I would walk in waving, <laughs> shaking hands. <laughs> it worked every time. <laughs> Do you have a favorite story, you know, from that time other than the, you know, the changing in the bathroom at that, is there any other kind of really outrageous story? One of the things that I always loved is that that year, 92, we, as Queer Nation and ACT UP, marched in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Chicago, which is a big deal in Chicago. A Sen Senator John Cullerton gave us his spot there. So we, and they did not know we were coming. All of a sudden, they look up and, you know, here we come with my camp, John J. Black president, and they were like, they turned, they were so shocked. They, the judging uh, stand, they turned their back on us. But it was also a little nerve wracking because this was the same year that in Boston, they forbade them to march at all. So that, you know, uh, and we took it and we said, not, not here, you know, not here. So uh, that was, a wonderful moment for everybody. And that was one of those times that you feel, I don't know how many demonstrations you all have been in, but boy, the camaraderie that happens after a demonstration like that is the best in the world. Mm -hmm. One of the best feelings in the world. And uh, besides, we lived. <laughs> St. Patrick's Day Parade, you know, that's, I was as Irish as I could be, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna ask. I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions, and we're gonna take a few from our from our audience. But um, this is to the both of you. I mean, looking at everything that's changed since '92, and you know, from you know, same-sex marriage to as you were talking, Whitney, about conversations about gender identity. Um, what do you see in that arc, and kind of what do you see ahead for the LGBTQ plus community? Wow. Well. president. I mean, why not? I mean, I, well, I think the whole point of what Terrence was doing and his lasting impact is the importance of represent, representative politics, right? If you don't have representation in the highest body of government, who's going to who's gonna take care of you, right? And so I think what I've really ex been excited about in the past couple of years has been the rainbow wave. So seeing a lot of LGBTQ plus people get elected to local politics, to state politics, and hopefully more and more to national politics. Um, I think the only way you're going to see the progress that we're all dreaming of is when the people that are affected by the problems that policy needs to correct are the ones that are there writing the policy, right? Like, I just feel yeah. like, we need more and more people, queer people, black people, brown people, LGBTQ people. I mean, all the people need to be in government because like, that's where things happen. And I think the thing that Terrence says about visibility, um, you know, it's, it's tough because there's a lot of representation in media and that's great, but it hasn't fully transferred into policy. Yes, there's same sex marriage. Yes, there's things that have been fought for for a long time, but you're still struggling with trans youth in bathrooms. You're still struggling with, um, you know, uh, healthcare. There's so many things that are still on the table. And I think what I would really love to see is this next generation 
take what Terrence did and crank that to the nth degree and um, run, run. I want to say that we are going to have to be stronger as a community than we ever have been because you must remember that the Supreme Court we have now could take same-sex marriage away. They could make that happen. And they're that conservative. So, you know, we're going to have to really be on top of things now, much more so than we were back then, I think. You know, mm. now we've kind of gotten a little, yeah, we can get married and everything, but that's, this Supreme Court is going to, it's ugly. And it's going to be ugly for a long time. So we're going to need to be a lot more vigilant than we were before and more unified. Yeah, and just sense. going off of that really quick, Terrence. Sorry, Erica. I just wanted to say well, that I think, so. I think that something that I think is also really important is recognizing the people that were already doing the work and then acknowledging them and working with them. So working with people like that are still here and around. You know, he talked about the camaraderie. I think it's really important for people my age and younger to interact with the older generation and to hear their stories and to um, understand this sense of camaraderie that Terrence was talking about. So that's just the only other thing I wanted to say was that I think it's really important to do cross-generational work as well, because I think you can get so um, embedded in your circle, but if we're really talking about this cohesion that Terrence just laid down, it has to be all across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But that's what you just did with this film, girl, because, you know, <laughs> you know, so... Yeah, we're on the we're on the path. That's for sure. That is for sure. Well, thank you both. I'm gonna ask a couple of audience questions now. Um, got about three or four. We'll see how many we can get in. Um, the first one is from Felicia, um, and I guess this is probably to both of you. Um, do you think that shows like RuPaul's Drag Race have helped people understand and accept drag as an art form? And how do you feel about cisgender women being drag artists? I don't know who wants to tackle that one first. Terrence, I'll let you speak to it since you've done drag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say, yes, it is an art form. Of course it is. I mean, you know, you have to, I don't know if you know this, but every drag queen that you ever see anywhere, you have to say, you look fabulous, even if they don't. You have to say, you look fabulous, because they, believe me, they didn't walk out of the house unless they thought they did. Um, and, and this one, yeah, I, and it, any, look, if you can have a 10-year-old boy as a drag queen, you can have cis drag queens, you can have, although I'm still a little confused about all that. I don't know where I stand in that. But, yeah, I always say, what is, what is it wearing? If it's wearing a dress, <laughs> you know, was, that's why I like drag kings, too. You know, people are like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, well, but there's room for all of it, and there should be, you know. Yeah. And I, I think like speaking to um, the popularity of, of RuPaul and, and Drag Race, um, I think it has helped. I mean, you you get language, right? And you um, you kind of peel back the curtain and you see the normalcy of it. And I, if you've seen the show, it's very dramatic and it's, um, you know, heightens entertainment. But I think, you know, it starts the conversation and it's an entry point and that is important. And I think that is the lasting impression of media representation is that it's an entry point. It shouldn't be the, the, the only interaction you have with communities you aren't familiar with, but I think what media can do is it can break the barrier and it can make it a lot easier for people that wouldn't normally um, be accepting or be interested, have an avenue to go down that. So um, I think, there's nothing wrong with RuPaul's Drag Race. I think, um, you know, it has its lane and it's doing a lot of great things for the culture. Um, but I, I do understand the need to go beyond just the commercialization of drag, right? Um, yeah. I think there's more to it. But look at the talent that RuPaul's show has brought. Todrick Hall is amazing. Bob the Drag Queen. I mean, we. this is wonderful because... We didn't have production values like that in the 70s, I'll tell you. You know, we didn't those too, but we didn't like that. 
So, you know, it's just wonderful to see that happening. Definitely oh, elevated the art form and made it more expensive, I'm sure. For okay, sure. Okay, for a lot more expensive. <laughs> Okay, this one's from uh, Bray, I believe is how you pronounce their name. Um, how can we eliminate uh, the fear and misunderstanding between the Black and LGBTQ community, which I know is a, a big one. I've written about this in the past. Uh, that's a huge question. I, I'm actually really interested to hear yeah, both of you. Yeah, I'm getting trouble because I have a, I have a definite, definite answer for that. But I think, Let's okay, I'm going to say is I think it has something to do with the church. Anytime mm -hmm. I think it's something to do with the church. I can't go into it now. The LA Times would be very upset with me if I said what, you know, but it in some ways that those Christian beliefs have held people back. And if they can't get, you know, a lot of times that's the first, you know, you're the in a gay, in a black family, you're the first one they've ever heard of. And, you know, they're, you know, but if you look at the examples of, well, I'm going to say a little Richard, but there's so many examples of church going guys who turn out to be gay as well as, you know, and the church is a big thing in the black community. Um, so there's got to be some work done there. Um, and there's got to be the whole masculinity thing. And, you know, as quiet as it's kept, black people are matriarchal, not patriarchal, okay? Um, Angela Davis, remember the Million Man March? Angela Davis said every single one of those men had to ask their mother or their wives if they could go. And I was like, thank you, Angela. You know, so, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of work to be done there. You know, there is. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Whitney, what do you think? Man, I mean, that's a big question. And I, I always have to preface things that, you know, as a light skinned person, I'm not interacting with the same type of conflicts that someone um, darker skinned might interact with. I, I have a lot of privilege in that way. And so, you know, for me, it's very interesting to think about the intersection of my queerness and my blackness in those two communities. But I think ultimately, it's understanding that there is an intersection. And I think what happens when you're talking about disparate marginalized groups, um, there's this kind of, um, man, how do I phrase this? There's almost this like oppression scale, right? And it's like, well, I'm more oppressed than you are. And so you need to like understand where I'm at. And it's like, we're all oppressed. We're all under the patriarchy and white supremacy um, and yeah. capitalism and all the things that are are not really helping us as a community. And so I think just understanding that our problems are interconnected, our struggles are interconnected, and that we are not that different. Like, I think, um, you know, you mentioned Angela Davis, and I'm going to bring up um, Huey P. Newton for a second. I mean, the Rainbow Coalition, that was the, that was like, mind blowing, right? And I think that's what mm -hmm. we need to be getting towards is like bridging the gap and understanding that our problems together can be solved greater than disparately. You know, and just in a small, small way, in the mid to late seventies, we were doing it on, the, I know it's gonna sound weird, but we were doing it on a dance floor. We were getting everyone together on the dance floor and there's no it's no accident that that music talked a lot about unifying people um because that's what we believed we were doing and we were i think that's why they brought it into it because it was getting too good you know um it it become this wonderful and i mentioned that in the movie we had become this wonderful strong community that all of a sudden had to stop and, you know, uh, deal with saving each other's lives more so than, you know, so, the, you know, that took a lot of uh, the excitement of being in, on a dance floor away. Um, I, that's kind of coming back at a little bit, but I don't go out anymore. I'm too old, so. <laughs> but they're, they're, you know, that was really, that was something that was real for us back then. Mm -hmm. Back then. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, last question, and this one's from Bianca, but I, I feel like this is probably a question a lot of people have is, how can we support you now, Terrence? Are you, are you planning on another run for president or are we? Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. no, no, I don't think so. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to do my, I used to have a talk show here. I'm hoping to start doing that again. I've just got a website, so we're gonna, you know, try and do a few things there. But I'd love to do my, I'd love to do that talk show again. That was a, I was like the drag Oprah for a while and I would love to do that again. But probably on on this medium, Zoom, you know, so I don't have to go anywhere. But uh, something like that, you know, because that was really that was a way to stay up on what was going on in the community. Anything mm -hmm. I could do to do that, you know, because uh, I I'm and I'm working on my book. You know, you can always should I say this? Can they donate? I don't know. You know, donate to the don't have black money if you want to. Uh, yeah, I, I'll pick it up for you, Terrence. You don't have to tell people what to do. I'll tell people what to do. Oh. You can go to terrenceallensmith.com and you can keep up with Terrence there. Um, we have the film there. We have old photos there. You can also donate to support Terrence's other endeavors. And then there's also a shop on there where you can get Joan Jet Black swag. So, yeah, yeah. um. Uh, yeah, TerrenceAllenSmith.com is where you can keep up with Terrence and support him. It's amazing. I'm actually going to go there right after I get off the Zoom call. So, but in any case, thank you both so much for, for taking the time to talk to us. It was super enlightening, educational, hilarious, all of the things. So, um, thank and thank you everybody else who tuned in and I hope everybody has a good night. Yes. Thank I'll you, Erica. Thank you, Erica, so much. Thank Mrs. you both. Mrs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's a Mrs. Smith with her red glasses. Love her. Um, yeah. Ciao. Ciao.